two things real closely today, and then we're going to go on to uh, look at another example. And the reason I'm looking at these things closely is because I really want to make sure you understand them. Um, you know, you might wonder, like, well, why do I have to know this much detail? Can I just do it? I mean, the rules are simple enough, blah, blah, blah. But I think it's important to really understand those things. And the two things we're going to look over, we're going to look at, in the example that we have, the simple tip calculator, we're going to look at what it means to be an interface, and we're going to look at one instruction in particular, and we're going to break it down in gory detail. All right? So first of all, an interface. And here's what makes sense to me, and I hope it's useful for you. Um, a USB device. What is a USB device? Can someone name examples of USB devices? Flash drive. What else? Mouse, keyboard. Anything else? Camera. Microphone. I don't know, a bunch of stuff. All right, <laughs> is the point of that. What does it take to be a USB drive, uh, a USB device? What does it take to be a USB device? In other words, if you look at these, these are all different things that do totally different functions. What does it take to be a USB device? Yes? It has to plug into a USB port. Yeah, number one, first and foremost, it has to have the right plug-in. In other words, you couldn't plug a regular conventional headphones into USB because it just doesn't have the right plug. All right? And you probably need something else, too. Right? Probably need a small snippet of software, a driver, or something that says specifically what to do for that particular device. This is an extremely flexible situation because then you're allowed to have on your computer components. You can easily implement components. So you don't have to have a, uh, a port for your camera, a port for a flash drive, a port for a mouse, a port for a, um, what other things we have, microphone, a port for an external keyboard. All these can work through the same port, all right, because they are USB devices. They fit that category. Now, another way to talk about a plug-in is to talk about it as an interface, right, is what connects two things together. All right? And so we'd say as the right plug, it has sort of the right interface. And I think it's not a coincidence that the, in software-wise, when we talk about interface, we are talking about uh, the same sort of thing. The ability to plug in different things into anywhere, into, into many different places, so long as it has the right plug-in. All right? Now, Software obviously doesn't have plugins, all right? But let's talk about what, we, what, what that means for an interface. And in the example we had last time, let me bring up the code. Well, let's talk about it a little bit, and then we'll bring up the code. When we define an interface in Java, we define simply a list of functions. No properties in an interface. There's no attributes. The functions aren't even completed. So it's not even like there's code for the function. There is simply, simply what we called signatures of functions. What do I mean by signature of a function? I mean the type of return value, the name of the function, and the arguments that it takes. So that's all we define when we define an interface. We say, hey, your interface there, it has these, this function, this one function, or this two functions, or three functions, or however many functions we want. 
We simply define. And that is sort of like defining what the plugin looks like. All right? Because what can we put in the place of an interface? An interface isn't a class itself. It sort of describes a class. We could put anything in place of an interface. Just we can like plug in anything into a USB port as long as it has the right plugin. Well, what do we mean by right plugins? In this case, we mean it has all the functions defined in the interface it has implemented, all right? And it has code implemented for that, all right? If it has those functions, then we can say that this class, whatever class it may be, we can say it implements our interface. When we say that our class implements an interface, we are saying our class contains all the functions that the interface defines. That's all we're saying. It actually contains code for those functions, real code that really does something. So anywhere that you can put that interface, you can put any class you want to so long as it has those functions. Sometimes people describe an interface as a contract. In other words, when you declare an interface, you say, hey, you have to have these functions in order to call yourself an interface, to implement this interface. So you define a list of functions, and you say the class implements it. If it doesn't have those functions, if it's missing even one of them, you'll get a compiler and it says that can't implement that interface because it doesn't have all the necessary functions. If it has all the necessary functions, doesn't matter how they're coded. Could be coded any number of different ways. As long as it has those functions in it, then it can be used to implement the interface. And then you can plug that class in anywhere that that interface is expected. Just like you can plug a USB device into anywhere that has a USB port. So any place that takes that interface, you can plug in your class, all right? Um, and you're good to go, all right? Those functions describe what the interface does, all right? And you have to have code for it. Now let's look at our specific example. So let me bring down the, the code example we had last time. Open on my desktop the example from last time. Well, oh, that's still warming up. Can you read that code well? Or is it kind of small? I'll bring it in the Word, because I know I probably would have a hard time.
activity, we're going to forget this part for now. We'll come back to that later. But one thing we said is we said it implements view dot on click listener. That's an interface. All right. It is part of the package view and it's called on click listener. Where is the code for that? Can we see the code for that? No, it's part of the Android framework. It's part of the, the Android libraries that we download. So it's part of that framework. So we don't write that code. That code has been written and provided to us for us to use. So we don't have the source code for that. We have compiled versions of that. All right, so we can't see exactly what it does. But we could look up and see what it requires. In fact, let's go and do that now. Let's go and look. There is but one method on it. This is a simple interface. The plugin's real simple. All you need to have to implement this interface is an on-click method. That on-click method ex 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 uh, accepts as an argument a view. All right. And it returns nothing. So that's all we have to do to implement that interface. All right. So it's pretty straightforward. So we say this method or this 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 class that we're defining, our main activity, implements the on-click listener, listener interface. That means that somewhere on there, there needs to be a function that matches that signature. And right here it is. All right. So our, our activity itself, we're saying can serve in the role of an on-click listener. We can plug this class in anywhere that an on-click listener is required. All right. Because it has this method. And the details of the method, well, we'll look at in a minute. But Essentially, it handles the clicking of the button. All right. Where are we plugging it in? We're plugging it in right here. Because what we're saying is calc, which is our button, and we'll talk about this line in a minute here, the line above it. All right. We're talking about, we're saying that button, we're setting the on-click listener. We're plugging in the code. We're plugging in the component that's going to process what happens when the user clicks that button. All right? And the code is what? It's this. Any anytime when you see this, it means this object itself. So this activity is handling, contains the code that executes when you click that button. All right? When you click the calc button. And what is that code? Well, it's the code that's right here. All right? So, if we were to get rid of this on-click view and call it something else, all of a sudden, it gives us an error on that because we lied. We, says that imp we said that this implements that interface. We're promising that there is an on-click function by saying that. But there is no on-click function because we renamed it. And if we get this name back, we change it back, boom, the error goes away. All right. It's important to understand that. Now, in this case, we're using the activity itself to create... <laughs> we're using the activity itself. I thought someone was disagreeing with me. <laughs> We're using the activity itself to handle the clicking of the button. Now, that works fine and good in this example, because it's a real simple example, one button, blah, blah, blah. In 
other examples, when we're going to have more stuff, we might have more li on click listeners because you might want to do one thing if you click a button, button A, a different thing if you click button B, and so on down the line. Now, you could use the same on click listener for different objects, all right, for different objects. An example of that would be um, if, you had to, if you had a tic-tac-toe game, right? If you had a tic-tac-toe game, you might have, um, you know, a, a grid of, of, of three by three of, like, blank squares. Each one of those blank squares could be a button or could be something like a button, and you could put an on-click listener on them, and you could use the same on-click listener because essentially you do the same thing if you're playing tic-tac-toe regardless what space you click on. Right? You click on it, you make it an X or an O, you look to see if the person won. All right? So you could use the same on-click listener for a bunch of things on the page, or you could have separate on-click listeners for um, each thing. How do you know what got clicked? That's what this view, that's the argument, is. That view says who actually got clicked. So I could have more than one button on this page. I could have more, but more than one button on the page, and I could find out which button got clicked by looking to see what that view is. What is a view? A view is a lot of different things. All right. The whole layout that gets displayed on the screen is a view. Each little individual control is a view. So a view can be a group of other views or individual views. It's so essentially anything that you put on a screen, anything that you put on the screen is a view. So we could actually, by testing this, see what they actually clicked on. So we could have the same on click listener work for two different things. We would just have some code in here with an if statement. So that's the on click, that's the interfaces, and so on. Let's look at this. at these two lines of code. And we're going to draw some things. First thing it does is it creates, using that layout file, remember the layout XML file that we looked at last time and probably the time before, we are going to use that to set this activity's content view. All right? If you think of an activity as a screen that you're presenting to the user to do something, then it's the screen that they're seeing when they first go into this app. In this case, it's a real simple app. There's just one activity, one screen we're presenting to the user. So this is the, the view that they're seeing. So that XML that's out there is sort of a blueprint for the view that's eventually going to display on the screen. That is brought in, and that is set as this activity's content view. All right? Notice that there's nothing before set content view. What does that mean? Like here we have calc dot set on click listener. We're calling a function on an object. We're saying that button called the set on click listener. This we don't have anything before. What does that mean? Yes. Is, part of this class. is this class itself? Is this object itself? So set content view is a method that exists on the app compat activity class, right? Well, also in this class. Now, we don't have any code on this for that method because it exists, that code for that method exists in the super class or one of the previous super classes. So again, we don't see that code. We know that that function exists. We could probably find a description of what it does, what arguments it takes, and so on and so forth, but we don't actually see the code for that. Why? Well, that's something that the framework handles. That's a good thing for us. We're building on top of this Android framework, so we don't have to handle every little thing. Every activity is going to have a screen, so it's good that there's a function that does that bit for us, that we don't have to worry about writing that code. We just say, hey, this activity, your content view, boom, this is where it comes from and boom, it actually goes and creates that. What we're doing here, we're calling another function, findViewById, and we talked about this a little at the end of class, I think, last time, 
And I think I stuttered a bit and forth, but this would be a function on one of the ancestors of main activity, so app compat activity, or one of the earlier ancestors still. All right, so a class doesn't just have one superclass. A class could have a superclass. That class can have a superclass. That class, and there's a whole chain of inheritance that can happen. So let's look at these two lines of code. I'm going to put them up on the board. All right, I'm going to put the lines of code on the board, and I'm going to sort of draw pictures of what's going on. All right, in this code, so that we understand it, because we're going to see lines like this all the time. All right. We don't have to go far to see that. Down here, we have some more lines of code that look like that. So it's important, again, just like it's important to understand the interfaces, it's important for us to understand this bit. So, two instructions that I want are So those are the two lines. So let's imagine. This is our activity. A jar is a big box. We have out in our resource folder, in a directory called layout, our XML file, activity main. all the XML that we looked at before. One of the things it has, though, is this. It has a button. I'm just going to write part of the XML. Android ID equals plus ID slash calc. That's a plus sign, not a T. Then it has a bunch of other attributes. So, what happens when this statement runs? All right. When this statement runs, it takes this file and it creates an attribute called the content view that takes all the XML in this file. How come this file? R means resource. Layout is a layout folder. Activity main.xml is the name of the file. And it sort of brings it to life. So this is a blueprint of the layout. It actually goes and makes a view object. And this view object contains a bunch of subviews, right? A sub 
subview for the label up here, a subview for the edit text, a subview for the spinner, a subview for the button, and finally a subview for another label. So it creates a view that itself contains five views. So a view can contain other views. So the main content view for this guy, for this activity, contains these five views. All right? And this button, in addition to its other characteristics, has an ID of calc. These other things are other controls. This was a text. Um, text view that has something as an ID. This is an edit text view that has something else for an ID and so on down the line. So all different kinds of views in there that all have their own IDs. So these objects are out there living as part of this activity's content view. So the content view is a view and each of these things is a view. All right? So, that's what this does. This takes that blueprint, which is defined in XML, and actually makes real live view objects. All right? So those objects are out there. And they're out there in memory. Uh, well, I won't draw those, but they're all part of the activities content view. What does this line do? Well, let's look at this one at a time. I'm going to start at the far end and we're going to expand out. Nothing in front of this function. So this is a function on an activity. It's a function on main activity. It's not written in main activity, so it's in one of the ancestors of activity, of this main activity. So this is code that goes and finds a view somewhere within the main activity because I haven't specified anywhere else. Later on in the course, we might put something in front of that. That something dot find view. But right now we're not. Which means that it's looking in the activity's main content view. We're saying find the view on the page that has this for the ID. Well, part of this process of loading this XML file created sort of a referencing and an ID for each of these views. So we're finding the thing on the page. I keep saying page because I'm used to doing web development. Uh, and this is also very similar to, to get element by ID in JavaScript. All right. But find a thing on the view that has an ID of our ID calc. All right. That's this thing right here. So this finds the thing inside the content view that has an ID of calc. So this finds that object. So this finds this object over here. What is the button part needed for? Yes. Yeah, strictly speaking, it casts into a button. What does that mean, though? All right, let's, let's explore what that means. Find view by ID could find any kind of view. All right? This method could find any view that could exist within our content view, provided we gave it a different ID. If I gave it the ID of amount, AMT, it would find the edit text. If I gave the ID of service, it would find the spinner control. If I the page. So that find view by ID, I don't know what it's going to return. Let me rephrase that. The function doesn't know what it's going to return. The function simply knows it's going to find some view on that page on that bigger view, on the main content view. 
could be a button, could be a spinner, could be a, an edit text field, could be anything. All right. So, but we know, because we wrote this, right? We rigged the deck. We know that it's a button. All right? We know it's a button because we put it in the XML. It's a button and it has this as an ID. So we're going to we're going to like give that statement sort of inside information. Yeah, I know you're finding a view on the page. And I know in your mind it could be any view. But I'm the person that wrote this program and I know that it's a button. So take my word for it and treat it like it's a button. All right. What is the significance of that? Exactly what was, mess, was mentioned uh, by Garrett. The significance of that is if we tell it that it's a button, then we can treat it like a button. We can call button functions to it. All right. There are certain functions that don't exist on text boxes that exist for buttons. For example, the very next line, which says, I'm using a mouse for this PC on this one. There's too much stuff up here. The very next line, it says calc. Set on click listener that's a function that you do with buttons right couldn't do that on other controls probably not anyhow but I can't do it on buttons so therefore I need to know I need to tell the compiler hey you're finding a view all right. It could be any view. It could be any generic view. But I want to treat it like just some generic view. If I treated it like some generic view, then I can only do some very generic things to it. I want to treat it specifically like the kind of view that it is. Therefore, I tell the compiler, hey, this is a button. So therefore, treat it like a button and store it in a button object named calc. So what this does, looking at the left side of it, this says I'm going to have an object that's a button. And its name is going to be calc. And what button am I referring to? Well, the one that I find that has an ID of calc. And yeah, I know it's a button, so I'm going to put button there. So I can, I can take that, treat it as though it's a button, and now I have a pointer to that. Now I can write code for that button. Right? Because it's not just an object floating out there. I have an object reference that I can write code for. So if I want to click the button, disable the button, change the text on the button, I now can point to that object. So anything I want to do, I can do. All right? If you understand those two things and understand them well, you're in real good shape to go ahead with the next part of the class. All right. Uh, so like the goal for the first part of the week uh, last week was to just kind of figure out your way around Visual Studio and know where the files are and all that. Your goal for this week is to really have this kind of stuff down. What I want to do to finish off this part of it is go back and look at the code again for the simple tip calculator. And because uh, we'll see more code that looks like this like this one especially. the class goes in. We have our imports. Our imports allow us to point to different classes 
and so it knows what class we mean for sure. We have our main activity. We have our on create, which first calls the super. What does that mean? It calls the ancestors on create event. We're extending this event. In other words, we want our activity to do everything that a generic activity does, plus a few extra things. So super on create will go and execute the statements that exist in the ancestor code in, in the super classes that initialize an activity and it does whatever it does. There's a whole mess of stuff it probably does. But again, we don't have access to that code so we don't know what's contained in there. But we do act, have access to our class and we can say after you finish doing the main initialization, let's do these things. The first thing we do is we say set the content view to that XML file, which we went over. We then say, I want a pointer to the button. And that pointer is going to be called calc. And I want to find a thing in the content view that has an ID of calc. And I know it's a button, because I'm the one that wrote this, so I want to treat it like a button. And since it's a button, I can set the on click list there. Now, because I said that this activity is implementing that onClick listener, and because it in fact has an onClick event, I'm allowed to do this. I can say that my activity is going to serve the role, is going to contain the code that executes when this button gets clicked on. Now creating some other object, or something like that. I'm letting this activity itself, which is not a bad thing to do for a simple application. All right, so what does the onClick method do? All right, I think I forgot to mention this when I was defining interfaces, is it can have a lot of other functions as well, in addition to the ones in the interface, but it has to have the ones that are described in the interface. All right, edit text, E equals edit text, find view by ID. Text view T equals so these statements are identical in purpose to this statement. We find a thing in our content view that has a certain ID, and we tell the compiler to treat it like the kind of object it is. We can do that because we know what kind of object it is, because we made the code. This is simply setting variables to um, do the calculation. In this case, I'm grabbing the text from the text box, from the edit text field, e.getText. I can't call get text on a generic view because not every view has a get text, but an edit text field does have a get text. So I can call that, I can convert it to a string, and then I parse double to convert it to a double. My percent I get based on the selected item position this is sort of not needed. I don't know why that line of code is there. But I can test it to see if my spinner, which is S, see that has a different set of functions. The spinner has get selected item position. It tells you if the zeroth item was picked, if item one was picked, item two was picked. If the lowest one was picked, then I use 10% as a percentage, 15, 20. I do the calculation. Then finally, I can put that text in my text box using the, the set text uh, function. A few things to look at. If I were to go and say I go and change this to edit text. Let's say I go, I change this to spinner. Let's really mess it up. Oh. I'm surprised that the compiler, that, that the, the IDE knows something's wrong with that. Um, I wonder if that's an error or a warning. I 
can run this. It gave me an error on this line. I'm going to comment out this line. We'll try it again. So I want to get it a clean build. It gave me a clean build. It means it compiled it. But what happens when it goes and runs? I can go and type in 11, click calculate tip. Boom. It blew up. Let's see if we understand why it blew up. It blew up because I lied to it. I said that the thing that has an ID, RID tip, I said was a spinner. The, the IDE notices that that's something fishy, right? It gave me a warning, but it didn't give me a compile error. Why? Because it doesn't know. I could do all kinds of nonsense in my code so that by the time this code executes that it really would be a spinner. I could dynamically create some views or whatever. So it gives you a warning because it thinks something suspicious, but it lets it go and lets it compile. However, when you actually run it, that's when you run into the difficulty, right? Because I can't take a text box and turn it into a spinner. I can take a generic view and cast it as the kind of view that it is. But I can't take a view and cast it to a different kind of view. So I'd have to go and change this back to text view. And then I'm back in business. So you better be right when you cast those things, all right? If you're wrong, if you're lucky, it will give you a warning, all right? But it will give you a problem at runtime. And runtime errors are much worse to track down than compile errors. Compile errors are actually the good errors to get because that tells you right off the bat that there's something wrong and you know you have to go and fix it. Runtime errors can be very difficult to track down. You have to find out exactly what happened and what went wrong and could be very situational and, and so on and so forth. So you're much better off getting uh, compile errors as opposed to runtime errors. I'd like to talk about what's next even though we probably won't get onto it. Um, I put out there a dice game. Let me see if it's written. I think this is written in, in Eclipse. see how easy it is to convert this to Android Studio. I'm going to go and open it because this would be a good exercise for you unless it's really a, a pain in the butt. I'm going to say import from Eclipse from the desktop, dice game, okay. And there are, there are, in fact, some big errors. So I'll fix this before next time. There is also, and I'm not sure, you can actually Google it. Oh, wow, I have announcements from past semesters in here. I'll be darned. Um, 
the Deedle textbook has uh, Android Studio versions of apps um, that are included in the book, so you can download the tip calculator uh, as done in Android Studio. I will fix the dice game for next time, and the Dita one you should be able to just download and open now. Um, should be able to ample, uh, open that one as well. And you can download it from me or download it from, if you look up there, um, you just do a Google for Deedle. Um, the name of the textbook. We do have a textbook in this class, right? Okay, yeah. Um, it's uh, sometimes I forget because I like fill these things in like ages ago, and I have dropped textbooks at a couple classes, so it's it's hard for me to remember. Um, but the 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 class is based on Eclipse. All the code will be the same. It's just that you'll need the Android Studio version unless you really want to go through the gyrations of converting it. Um, in this case, um, yeah, this one's pretty straightforward. Oh, the, the tip calculator. Um, you enter an amount. One difference about this that you can notice is as you enter the amount, the tip's calculated, so you don't need a button. All right? Which obviously means something else is going on, right? There obviously is some other way to trigger code, so there's other kinds of listeners. There also is a different control here, namely a little slider. You can slide back and forth. To pick a custom percent instead of having my choice of having a spinner control. So this is a little bit different. Um, this will have uh, this will have two different listeners, right? Because it's going to look to see when the user interacts with the text box or the edit text uh, view and changes it and the slider. All right. Questions about this? All right. Anyone going to lab? All right, we'll see you on Thursday.